Yeah. I don't know if you heard that, but he said somebody or something is coming. He says maybe Messiah. Yeah. I'm off the lot. <laughs> Sounds to me like you might have to turn me down. Yeah. Okay. Located in the center of the circulatory system is a network of blood vessels and it carries that blood throughout the body. Definition. Heart. The central or innermost part of something. For example, in the heart of the city. Definition. Heart. Character. Feeling. Love. I got Chris's attention now. <laughs> Soul, affection, benevolence, compassion, concern, gusto, sensitivity, sympathy, tenderness, understanding, zest. Biblical definition of the heart. <laughs> Mind, soul, spirit, or one's entire emotional nature and understanding, the seat and the center of human life, figuratively represented. Now that correlates very well with the heart symbol. We all know the heart symbol. I don't draw it well, but we all know the heart symbol is anatomy. Uh, 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 thank you. I will never get that word out. Is that word inaccurately shaped? <laughs> <laughs> Our heart does not look like this. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, but it's the symbol that's often used to represent the center of our emotion. It's meant to, to show affection. It's meant to, to say love. And especially including romantic love. We use that symbol. So together one can say that it's the lotus, or it's the, the locus, I'm sorry, not the lotus. <laughs> It's the locus. It's the seat of the physical and of the spiritual being. There's compassion. There's understanding. It's life-giving, and it is complex. Nothing simple. We've got layers, don't we? Many, many layers. One of the Torah teachers came up. He heard them engaged in this discussion. And seeing that Yeshua answered them well, he asked him, which is the most important mitzvah, the most important commandment of them all? And Yeshua answered, the most important is, and I can just imagine he had all the ears tuned in. Spoiler alert, okay? He's not going to say the most important is knowledge of the Torah. He's not going to say the most important is to do mitzvah, to do good deeds. He's not going to say that it's external observances. He goes right to the heart. And he answers, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echa. And you've been with us, I think, long enough, and I think our guests tonight are familiar that you know what I've just said is our Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he continued on. He didn't stop there. But he quoted our Shema. And then he said, and you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your understanding, and with all your strength. 
That's recorded for us in the Brit Hadashah. That is a direct quote right out of Dabri, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which just happened to be in our parasha this week. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> it is the most revered prayer. It's the central part of Judaism. It's central to the Jewish mind. It's the beginning and the end of our everyday. The first thing that we should be praying, the last thing we should be praying. And it's every, how do I say the right way? Right? Religiously in the right way, not again just formula and liturgy. But religiously, our people want it to be the last words that are said when they are leaving this earth. That central, that important, that critical, and it comes right out of the Word of God. I want to look at it for a moment. First word. This one's easy for us because we're Shema. So we know that first word, Shema. And we've talked about that before. And it's here. Here. Open your ears to hear. God's speaking. Shema. Hear, O Israel. And what is Israel to hear? The Lord our God. Oh. I just want to stop right there and say, he's my God. He's our God. Right there, we've got something special. We've got a relationship. We've got a heartbeat starting to pump. And he says that he's the only one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one. I love the word one in Hebrew that's used is a chod. It is a united one. It gives us room to see Jehovah the Father, Yeshua the Son and the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. But they are three in one. They're not three separate gods. We worship one God. The one true and living God. The God who said, I am the God of Israel. They will be my people and I will be their God. And here it is, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And then when we continue right down from this, we come into that aha vav. And I love that because in English we go aha, aha. Well, it's just aha vav. Love. <laughs> love. And who doesn't want love? And who doesn't want to give love? We're made in that, that way that that's what floats every boat. But I'm going to ask you, God's telling us now. He's told us he's our God. He's the only God. But if he's telling us to love him, then how are we supposed to love him? Because in my poor English, I love chocolate cake, and I love my mom. Do I love those two the same? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a world of difference in that. How are we to love? What is God saying to us? What is he getting our attention? Open your ears, listen here. Remember, there's only one. I am the only one. When Jenna brought out earlier tonight that all other, quote, religions follow, take from, okay, I was going to use a word I should change it. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> but when we go back to that original, we go back to the one, the one true and living God. And he's saying, love me. Because I love you. I loved you first. Before we even knew how to love, he loved us. And he spells out how we're to love him. He doesn't leave us guessing. He knows we're ignorant. He knows we need to know. So he spells it out. Love me with your whole heart. Love me with your soul. Love me with your mind. Love me with your strength. What's left? I think that's all of me. He wants to encompass all of me. He wants me to take all of me and love him. But why do we say with all our heart? We're so accustomed to this that sometimes I think it loses its flavor because we just, we can, we can recite it, we can say it, we can, oh yeah, okay, I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure my definitions were not anything that informed you all. I'm sure you knew that before I ever started. But what's the Hebrew concept? We want to go back into our Hebrew roots. We want to look at what God is communicating with that statement. We want to go back to see what is the heart of the matter. And we see that it was first given by God. God said, I, and he 
that he would be our God. We would be his people. God initiates it. It all starts with him. We hear the words from Jehovah in Dabari, in our, in our parsha this week. But I've already told you, you heard the words right out of Yeshua's mouth. How did that happen? Could it be that even out of his words he's showing that God, Jehovah, and Yeshua are one, are deity, that he even being fully human at the same time was fully God. And he was speaking with the mouth of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then we get down where that Word came and tabernacled among us. And here we are, Yeshua tabernacling among the people and speaking with that. And he's quoting directly. He's not changing a word Jehovah said. He quotes it exactly. And he's, he's answering that this is the most important don't miss it. Don't get caught up on 10 verses 613. Don't get caught up on how, what, when, where, why. Just get to the heart of the matter. Just go back to the very root. Let's go back to the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for heart is lev or levav. Either way, you'll hear that word. And the ancient Hebrews knew. They knew there's an organ in their chest that's pumping, that's maintaining life. They know that that's the heart. But do you know our ancient Hebrews didn't have the, I'm going to say the concept because there's no word for it for the brain. They didn't separate it. The brain wasn't up here and the heart down here. The two were detached. Okay, we do that. And I will tell you it is very important because if you only have it here and you don't have it here, I'll put it as someone else put it. Don't miss heaven by 18 inches. The difference of space between your head and your heart. They do need to be united. They do need to be one. But for our ancient Hebrew people, they saw it as one. The, the brains were in the heart. The heart was what gave the brains life. And they're really right. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to fully understand that what is telling us, you don't have to be an intellectual. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I love David Jeremiah's way, God took the cookies and he put them on the bottom shelf so even the little children can get them. <laughs> he made it simple. He didn't complicate it. Man complicates it. But he said you would know with your heart. You would understand with your heart. You'd make a connection with your heart. Proverbs 14.33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of one who has understanding. What a proverb. Can take that one and think on it for the rest of the night. But don't right now. Stay with me. <laughs> to the Hebrews, the heart was where you think. The heart was where you made sense of the world around you. The heart was where you felt your emotions, as well as where you got this understanding, where you put the two together. And I'll give you an example in Scripture. Let's look at Hannah. Hannah, Hannah had such a pain in her heart. She was in agony. She was crying. She was hurting so badly. The priest mistook it and thought she was drunk. How sad. He missed the whole boat. It was wet. Hebrew word there is yara. And, and it, what it really means is quiver. And I think Hannah was in such agony that her whole body was shaking. The emotion, the heart, the everything. It was just all consuming her. The idea from that Hebrew word is grieving. It's a broken heart. That's how she felt. So the idea of a broken heart literally comes out of our biblical Hebrew. That's where that root is. And the Hebrews also believed that you could have fear in your heart. Now before you think that's far-fetched, think about your heart. When you get really excited, what's the heart do? When you get really scared, what's the heart do? It quivers. <laughs> you feel it. So it's not really so separate or so foreign. Sometimes I think we need to go back to our ABCs. We need to go back to the Hall of Faith. We need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back to our roots. And we need to get back to the heart. Because it's the heart that matters. It's the heart of the matter. That heart can melt. That heart can be depressed. That heart can be discouraged. But you know what else that heart can be? 
joyful, joyful. And I love it because you know what our Hebrew says when our Hebrew tells us that it's happy? It says good of heart or a heart of joy. That's the way the Hebrew expresses it. So if you want to say you're joyful, you can say my heart is joyful. My heart is exploding with joy. And that's, of course, the emotion we all want. But the ancient Hebrew people were gathering and, and realizing that that heart that's the generator of the physical life was also the center of the emotional and of the intellect. Because we do engage our brains. God never told you, check your brain at the door. He told you, bring that brain in, open it up, think on me, meditate on me, use the mind I gave you. So he's incorporating it. The heart is where choices are made. It's where we're motivated by our desires. I'll give you another biblical example. David, David. Scripture says in 1 Kings 8, 17 and 18, it was in his heart. You know what was in his heart? He wanted to build a house in the name of Adonai. I'm dwelling in this beautiful place. My Lord is in a tent. There's something wrong with that. And it was in his heart. It says, now it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of Adonai, the God of Israel. But the Lord Adonai said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Now he didn't let David build it because David was a man of war. He had blood on his hands. So it falls to his son, but David got to bring all the plans together. He got to get it going. And he got to envision it. But again, when we read heart in that scripture verse that I just read, that's Levon, right out of our ancient Hebrew, that's talking about the inner man, the inner mind, the will, and the heart. They're all together. You really can't separate them. They really are coming together. You know what Natan Nathan said to Dougie? Whatever is in your heart, do it. Do it. It was in his heart. That comes out of 1 Chronicles 17.2. Just to back up my words with scripture, then Natan Nathan said to Dougie, do whatever. Or if you read it in a complete Jewish, go do everything that's in your heart. And I love that. Go put feet to it. Do it. Don't just talk. Don't just think. Do it. Biblically, we have Lev or Levav over a thousand times in Scripture. No worries, I'm not taking you to a thousand Scriptures tonight because I can't keep you here all night, but obviously there's so much meaning in here. It's more than just one aspect. We have to see the consciousness. We have to see the mind. We have to see the status of our deep feelings. Let me take you to Tehillim and to the Psalms because the Psalms aren't and especially David's. If they aren't his feelings, his emotions, if you don't ride the roller coaster of his heart with him, the up and the down and all of that. But I love it summed up in chapter 44, verses 20 and 21. I'm only going to read one phrase. You can read the rest later. He knows the secrets of the heart. I love that. I love that. And what I found kind of interesting in our Hebrew we can make the V sound, V as a victory, or we can make the B sound, V as a baby, the interchangeable. So if we go from Lev in our Hebrew, which is almost low, it's still a little different, but we know our vowel sounds are very close in the markings in Hebrew. We take that over into our English, and we get the word low. And lobes, they talk about lobes of our heart. They're not really lobes, but how did they get named lobes? I think somebody was trying to say Hebrew and didn't quite get it right. <laughs> I don't know. But I found it interesting because, again, it's not anatomically. I got it out. I got it out. Wow. I'm growing up. <laughs> it's not the correct name. The, the scientists, the doctors, they'll tell you chambers and so forth, but... I just found it interesting where English, I think, is just coming right off of our Hebrew there. Just, you know, some people have a little trouble pronouncing Hebrew in English. But the biblical thought, again, is the heart is the center of all the parts of the human existence. And that's why we read in Proverbs 4, verse 23, Above everything else, guard your heart. For it's the source 
of life's consequences. And if you wait in that sentence for a moment, in, in another it says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I hear so many times, God get blamed. You know, it's funny, he doesn't get blamed for the good. I rarely hear somebody say, you know, why did God do this to me and say it about something good? But they put that negative on him all the time. And our world thinks that way too because they'll call an act of God, a tornado and a hurricane, but they don't call an act of God a blessing or something that fills your heart with joy. And I think how wrong, how wrong that conception is. King Solomon, King Shlomo, he emphasized the importance of protecting the innermost being, our source of our thoughts and our beliefs and our attitudes and, our, and all our actions. And if we're guarding our heart, that's going to tell us what kind of consequences we're going to be dealing with, what our life is going to be like. Because I have seen people in the worst tragedies with such a heart of joy now, don't get me wrong, there's a difference between joy and happiness. No one's happy in the midst of tragedy, but they can have the joy of the Lord, which is their strength. But it's a matter of how they're guarding their heart. It's a matter of how they are looking at their circumstances, because it's so powerful that those emotions, those thoughts, can lead us down the path that's detrimental, it can lead us down the path of righteousness. Do we want to head toward destruction or do we want to head toward righteousness? And that's why we've got to guard our hearts because the heart is susceptible. It's susceptible to our, our thoughts and those can be sinful thoughts, those can be wonderful thoughts. If they're scriptural thoughts, we know we're safe. But our attitudes, our beliefs, it's everything what goes into the heart is going to be what comes out. So what are we allowing into our hearts? Because that verse in Proverbs says everything's going to flow out from that. So if you find yourself in a world of negativity, what have you taken into your heart? How are you processing it? Are you guarding your heart? Are you guarding it from external influences? let alone the internal factors, which you have to take into play also, that we need to be very mindful. What are we setting our affections on? What do we really love? What do we spend our time involved with? What do we give attention to? If we're getting attention and if we're spending time in a world of negativity, it's going to lead to bitterness. It's going to lead to anger. It's going to take a root in our heart, a root of bitterness. And it's going to lead us down a path that none of us want to be in. That is a wrong behavior. And we know that. We know better. But what are we doing? Are we feeding that? Or are we guarding ourselves against it? In Ephesians 4.31 it says, Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of rage. Get rid of anger. Get rid of violent assertiveness and slander along with all spitefulness. I think it covered every avenue. I think it just summed it up in every direction. But I'm sure you know, and I've met, met people who seem to want to wallow in it. They have a right to feel this way. They have a right to those negative emotions. They have a right to be angry at someone who did something to them. But is that really beneficial to them? Is that where God says that their heart should be? Is that godly thoughts? Because God tells us to choose godly thoughts. Colossians 3, 2 says, focus or set your minds on the things above, not on the things on this earth. I don't think there's anything above that could be described as something that would give me rage or anger that would be leading to violence or slander from above? Not a chance. Not a chance. Philippians 4 says, finally, brothers and sisters, this is for everyone, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, think on these things. I didn't hear anything 
anything in there that would cause anger, bitterness, that would cause me to slander or someone to slander me. These are the words and where our mind needs to be. If we're seeking wisdom from God, if we're seeking to be guided by God, Proverbs 4, 7 says the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. Get started. That's what you need to do. You want to acquire it. And with all your possessions, get understanding. Acquire understanding. So ask God for that wisdom. Ask Him for the understanding of that wisdom. How many of you have met somebody who is so intelligent, and yet there's that blind spot? There's that off that they just, they don't know how, how to live, you know, in this level. They're just... They're just missing it. And I think that's what God's warning against. Don't be so intellectual. Don't be so high minded in your thoughts. Don't have all of this. Spell it out. Use big words and impress everyone with, with your vocabulary and, and how many languages you speak and how many degrees you have after your name. That's such man thought. Man's the one that says, oh, then, then here's your accolades. But that's not what God is saying. He's saying what's in the heart. Out of that is the spring of life. Remember he said, and we talked about it, that out of the innermost being would flow rivers of living water for those who came to him who were thirsty and drank from him. That's what we want to be coming out. Remember that physical heart's pumping all this out to every extremity, to every organ, to every part of our body that moves. That blood's pulsing through me right now or I wouldn't be able to stand here and to speak to you. And if that's coming out of the heart, what's going to come out? Because remember when we're acquiring that wisdom and getting that understanding with it, what I gave you earlier in Proverbs 14, 33, wisdom rests in the heart of the one who has understanding. It's not just knowing, but it's knowing what to do with what you know, knowing how to apply it, knowing how to use it. So how do we acquire wisdom? The same way we ask, how do we love? And we've got an answer to that, and we'll still expand on it. But how do we acquire wisdom? How do we get understanding? And James, in our Rita Chodeshah, Yadikov, says in James 1.5, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. That's pretty simple. We all know how to go to ask from the one who has. And he says, he gives to all generously and without reproach. And it will be given to him. There's how. You don't know how? Great. Go to God and ask Him. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you generously. He's not going to hold back. He's not going to say, what are you asking that from me for? He's going to say, come on in. Let me share with you. Let me tell you how to apply. Let me tell you where to focus your mind. Let me help you so that that can pump out the rivers of life that you want. So in guarding our hearts, we're taking responsibility. And that's a word this world does not like. And I will tell you, that's our biggest downfall. If we would teach from the very beginning that we are responsible, that there are consequences to our actions, instead of, oh, it's my mama's fault because she ate too many Twinkies when she was pregnant with me, or whatever excuse they give, we need to start to realize the buck stops here. I'm responsible. I'm the one feeding my heart. I'm the one that needs to guard my heart. And of course, I can't do it in my own power, but God never said, hey, you got to do it. You're on your own. Remember, he said, you would be my God. I would be his people. I like being a people. <laughs> I think that's cool. It's imperative to guard our hearts. First, it's imperative because if we want a good relationship with God, this will have a significant impact on it. If you don't have a good relationship with God, where does the responsibility land? Is God letting you down? Is it God's fault? I have news for you. He does everything perfectly. So if you don't have a good relationship with God, it's on you. And if you have been close to the Lord and you're not now, who walked away? Because I will guarantee you, 1,000 times out of 1,000, you are the one that walked away. 
that God stood there and waited with arms open wide, looking for his prodigal to come back. He didn't move away, and he didn't even say, oh, well, I'm done with them, and turn and go. He waits, and he says, come, come, come to me. So it's very, very important. If you want a relationship with God, take the responsibility. You've got to take action and put action to your words, to your thoughts, to what God puts. That condition of your heart can either push God away, and I see many times, sadly, in our tragedies, that's what we allow it to do. How could a good God do that? Really? Really? You want to blame God, the creator of the universe, who keeps it all going for us, who gives you air to breathe daily, who tells you, I'll walk with you, I'll carry you when you're too tired. You want to get in his face and say, but you know what can also happen? In the midst of that tragedy, when you cry out to him, and you can cry out like Hannah. You can cry out with a quivering heart with your whole body shaking and trembling. You can cry out your agony. He took on human form. He understands. He knows what it feels like to be rejected. He knows what it feels like to be just worn out. He knows what it is to feel like that's overwhelming. He took on human form. And you can draw close to him in that. Because what do we do when we're having a, a specific trial and we know someone else who dealt with that issue? That's who we run to talk to, isn't it? We go to that one who we know they can relate and we find from them what helped. And if they have wisdom, they're going to turn us to the Lord. They're going to be a scripture. They're going to say, you know, when I was walking through those waters or that shadow, this verse is what taught to my heart. And nine out of ten will talk to the heart of the one who sang it. Because our hearts are radically transformed when we meditate on the Word of God. When we meditate on Him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us not to be anxious for anything, but in everything with prayer. We all know what that means. With supplication. You know what supplication is? 